Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker. Um, you all know um, Mark Mish of HAO. Um, he got his PhD. He got his PhD in '98 from um, University of Colorado, um, Jilla, and then went on to do a postdoc at the uh, um, Goddard, and then. Uh, <laughs> and then join ASP. I was asked to do this like two minutes ago. Um, we all know him very well, and he works on interior dynamics, and he joined the uh, scientific staff of HAO in uh, 2007, and then has been here since. So uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have him talk about the interior dynamics. Okay, so yeah, th this was poor planning. I'm usually the one who did do the introductions, and it was, uh, I was thinking it was a luxury that I don't have to do the introduction, but I suppose I had to uh, uh, at least arrange for somebody to take my place. Is this on, by the way? Can you hear me? I'm just gonna dim the lights a bit. And so yeah, I'll be talking today, thanks for coming, I'll be talking today about uh, our efforts to model the origin of solar magnetism. Uh, so I'll talk, I'll start with the, let me just keep track of time. I'll start by, yes, and I have a pointer. I'll start by uh, describing the, the challenge we have, uh, what um, observations tell us about the solar cycle and solar magnetism. And I'll talk about the solar cycle as a manifestation of order amidst chaos. And I'll describe the current state of dynamo modeling, and in particular, a very important question uh, that's a hot topic now are, in regarding sunspots. Are they essential for the operation of the dynamo, or are they uh, a byproduct, a superficial byproduct of the dynamo action that occurs in the deep interior? And then I'll tell you about how we're going beyond this state of the art and building a next generation dynamo model this, believe it or not, is the first ever dynamo model that actually has sunspots in it. And this is uh, the cornerstone of uh, HAO's space climate initiative. This is uh, uh, an idea that originated in HAO, but now we have uh, university collaborators. We have people at uh, LASP and CU that are interested in this as well. And the idea is to link a dynamo model with models of the corona in heliosphere and irradiance um, to, to look at the long-term uh, effects of solar variability on the Earth's space environment and uh, climate system, which is uh, pretty much what uh, HAO's Frontier 2 is identified in the strategic plan. <coughs> and then this dynamo model is exciting, but it has a lot of physics that has to go into it to, to build this dynamo model. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, the complementary modeling and observational efforts we're doing to clarify what those input physics are. In particular, what's the maternal circulation, how is magnetic flux transported, and how do you actually build sunspots? And that's another of, of HAO's frontiers. So it will come as no surprise to everybody in this room that solar variability is linked to magnetism, and that magnetism is created in the interior of the sun and it passes through the surface of the sun. And the sites where it passes through the surface of the sun, we see them, we call them active regions. And for the purposes of this talk, there are subtle differences, but for the first purposes of this talk, I'll, I'll essentially talk about active regions and sunspots as, as meaning the same thing. Uh, but these are, these are active regions or sunspot groups or pairs and uh, they form the basis of, of loops of, of, of magnetism that extend up into the corona. And this magnetism that passes through the solar surface provides the energy that, that powers space weather. Uh, in particular, solar uh, drivers of space weather, such as coronal mass ejections, flares, and the solar wind. So to, or, to understand the origins of, of solar magnetism, if you take a, look, a very close look at the surface of the sun, what this is, is a, a magnetogram. It shows the line of sight uh, magnetic field in the disk center of the sun, uh, uh, calculated from the Zeeman effect from the Solar Optical Telescope on Hinode. And white patches here indicate field that's pointing toward you. 
Uh, dark indicates field that is pointing away from you into the sun. So the point here is it's a mess, that, it, that the smallest scales that you can look at, you see mixed polarity. You see a lot of random structure in, in the magnetic field of the sun. And it's chaotic. It changes. It, it has a, a replenishment time scale of, of only about 48 hours, uh, two days. And so, so this is what we expect. Uh, one of the uh, advances in, in dynamo theory in the last two decades is the understanding of turbulent dynamos. Uh, and by dynamo, I mean a fluid flow, a conducting the flow of a conducting fluid that converts kinetic energy of fluid motions into magnetic energy. And so there's been a, a, a pretty good understanding of turbulent dynamos in the last two decades. And we understand now that turbulent flows tend to build turbulent magnetic fields. And this is what we see on the surface. So this, the, the complexity is relatively easy to understand. What is harder to understand is if you take a map like this over the full disk of the sun and you average over longitude. So you average it over longitude and then plot it as a function of latitude and time. So this is a magnetogram. Instead of white and black here, we have uh, yellow and blue indicating magnetic field that's pointing in and out of the surface of the sun. So this is the mean magnetic field, the axisymmetric component. And the things to notice here are at the north and south pole, you have a flip in the polarity goes from positive to negative to positive to negative, and it's relatively symmetric about the equator. So there's polar field reversals on a time scale of, of every 11 years or so. And then at mid-latitudes, you have these lobes. Uh, latitudes less than plus or minus 30 degrees, you have these lobes, and these come and go every 11 years. This is what's known as the magnetic butterfly diagram of the sun, because these lobes look like uh, a chain of butterflies flying from, from left to right. But of course, what these lobes are, are associated with active regions. They're associated with sunspots. And if you look closely at what causes these polar field reversals, we don't really know. But at least at the surface, it looks like that the magnetic flux that causes those field reversals comes from these active regions, that it comes from low latitudes. It travels up to the poles. And at least superficially, it looks like that is responsible for flipping the dipole moment on the surface of the sun. So a full magnetic cycle, so this happens every 11 years, you get a reversal. So a full magnetic cycle is roughly 22 years. But as I said, this magnetic butterfly diagram is, is indicative of sunspots in active regions. So you see the same butterfly type pattern in sunspots. This is and it goes, we, we only have magnetogram data for less than a century. But we have sunspot data that goes back four centuries to, to the 1600s and sporadic sightings before then. So you can trace back solar activity <coughs> um, for, for centuries, even millennia, if you look at uh, geophysical proxies of solar activity. Uh, but the idea is that the cycle has been continuing for, for a long time, as, as long as we can determine. There are periods where it appears to be suppressed, known as grand minimum. But, but the cycle keeps going. And sunspots, I said, were sites of flux emergence. Uh, they're, they're, they're sites where magnetic energy passes through the solar surface. So they're sites of coupling between the interior and the corona. But they're also touchstones of solar activity. These are the things we measure solar activity by, and in, particularly, uh, in particular when we, when we um, go back to previous solar cycles and, and look at, look at what, what, what the sun is doing over very long time scales. And these butterfly diagrams are also associated with the sunspot cycle. So as, as you see sunspots, they appear at mid-latitudes. Those go away. New ones come up slightly closer to the equator. Those go away. It continues. And so the, the, so the peak in sunspot number, so this is just a histogram of the sunspot number. And so the peak in the sunspot number goes up and down every 11 years. Some cycles are stronger than others. Uh, but we've numbered the cycles basically on each 11-year cycle. We're now in solar cycle 24. But again, this is 11-year sunspot cycle. The magnetic cycle is, is 22 years. So where does this self-organization come from? 
you have a chaotic magnetic field that you see in a very highly turbulent convection zone. How do you make organized field like sunspots and dipole moments and magnetic cycles? And there are basically two camps, the red camp and the blue camp. Um, and both, what's that? Yes. <laughs> no, 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 no political uh, connections. I should have made them green. Um, no. <laughs> No, it depends what state we're in, I suppose. <laughs> Who's the good guy? <laughs> uh, no, so, uh, so there's a convection. And both of them have been around for more than half a century. And both of them are still very much alive today. So there's one camp that says convection can do it. And basically, uh, the key here is helicity, kinetic and magnetic helicity. What's helicity? Kinetic helicity, this is vorticity. So, Velocity dotted into the curl of velocity is kinetic helicity. So if you have vorticity in the same direction as your velocity, then you have spiraling fluid motions like this. And, what's, and those spiraling fluid motions, the kinetic helicity, when you, put a, when you thread a magnetic field line through there, it leads to magnetic helicity, A dot B, where B is the curl of A. So A is the vector potential. So this thing is important because this, in ideal MHD in a highly conducting plasma, this thing is conserved. So if you twist fields on small scales, induce helicity, it will unravel on large scales with the helicity of the opposite sign. So this provides a link between small and large scales that can build large scale magnetic fields. And the other key ingredient is rotational shear. So if you have a differential rotation, we know in the sun the equator spins faster than the poles that can stretch out magnetic field lines, and we attribute the origin of sunspots to that stretching. So the example, classical turbulent alpha effect that's been around for 50 years in current MHD convection simulations, which do exhibit dynamos and cycles. The main supporting evidence for this comes from stellar observations. We look at stars. We see that stars that have convection also have magnetic activity. And furthermore, the faster they spin, the more activity they have. So this is exactly what you expect from this, from this picture. The main doubt is the magnetic Reynolds number. This is something that uh, quantifies in the magnetic induction equation of magnetohydrodynamics, MHD. It quantifies the relative importance of the advection term to the diffusion term. In stars, this is tremendous. It's at least 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 10th. Uh, in simulations, it's more like 10 to the 3, 10 to the 2 or 10 to the 3. So we're not sure if, if these simulations are going to operate the same way in real stellar parameter regimes. So the other camp is flux emergence. So this, this idea, and I'll talk more about this, but the basic idea is that sunspots can drive a dynamo. And it's powered by rotational shear magnetic buoyancy instability, and it's shaped by the Coriolis force convection, and I'll describe how that occurs. Example are babcock Leighton dynamo models, which I'll talk about, and what I call Sprout sp Spaghetti Dynamo. Hank Sprout won the Hale Prize uh, a few years ago, and he gave a talk about how, how he thinks things are going. I, I won't talk about that, but, um, but if you know about this, this, this falls into this class of flux emergence-driven um, dynamos. And the main supporting evidence for these is exactly what I showed you. It's this. It sure as heck looks like. We don't really know what's going on below the surface, but it sure as heck looks, looks like this reversal is associated with the presence of active regions. <coughs> so nagging doubts are, is that enough? Uh, is, um, is, is, does that provide enough of a poloidal field source to sustain the dynamo? And, According to this picture, if there are no sunspots, the cycle should not exist. That the cycle require, requires sunspots in order to operate. And I won't go into this in detail, but there's some evidence that this may not be the case. But so, so the, the, the tr truth might lie somewhere in between yellow or orange. Or <laughs> um, but so I'll talk about this one first. We, we've had our foot in both, uh, um, both corners doing the splits. Um, but this is, so, so this is uh, convective dynamos. This is the red corner. So this is uh, three simulations done with the so-called ASH code, analastic spherical harmonic code. Um, and this is three different rotation rates. So this is uh, 
at a period of 28 days like the sun. This is three times faster. This is five times faster. Left column shows the convective patterns. Uh, yellow is upflow. Blue, black is downflow. Here shows the differential rotation. Pink is fast. Blue is slower. Uh, here is the mean toroidal field and longitude averaged over longitude. So red and blue indicate east and west. And this is a, equivalent to a butterfly-like diagram. So this is the mean toroidal field near the bottom of the convection zone as a function of latitude and time. So you can see this guy has a couple of irregular reversals. But the main thing I want to point out here is that as you increase the rotation, as you have more helicity, more shear, scales of convection get smaller, magnetic field gets bigger. The scales of the magnetic field gets bigger. The, uh, the, so the mean flows, mean fields get stronger. So this is magnetic self-organization. This is an example of how helicity and shear can uh, induce the, the formation of coherent structures with coherent magnetic structures on large scales with, um, with, uh, with patterns like asymmetric about the equator and even magnetic cycles. These things reverse uh, cyclically. And here, these mean fields occupy about 4% of the total magnetic energy. Here, it's more like 50%. So, so we see magnetic self-organization. You may know of another high-profile set of simulations, similar MHD convection simulations that exhibit cycles. This is, again, a, a latitude uh, time diagram of the toroidal field at the bottom of the convection zone from a different code, uh, Gizarro et al., 2010. So these things exhibit cycles, and it's a very promising area of research. But the main problem with them is they don't really have sunspots. Every other solar dynamo model, the toroidal field at the bottom of the convection zone is taken as a proxy for sunspots. So what difference does that make? How can flux emergence, or the presence of sunspots, influence the operation of the dynamo? Well. Uh, Again, 50 years ago, Babcock um, brought this up, and, and Leighton also, uh, uh, 50 years ago. I think that's 60. No, no that's 64. Um, but the idea is that as, as, so where do we think sunspots come from? There, there's a little NASA-generated movie up here. Basically, we think sunspots come from toroidal fields near the bottom of the convection zone. The sun is convective from in the outer 30% of its radius, so from about 0.7 to the surface. And we think there are submerged toroidal fields which become unstable due to the magnetic buoyancy instability. They rise and they poke out the surface, and that's what, that's what sunspots are. So sunspots come in pairs. And basically, if you think of this in a, as an idealized flux tube, as this thing rises, its center of mass is getting farther away from the rotation axis. So conservation of angular momentum means that you drive a retrograde flow within that tube. But the Coriolis force acting on a retrograde deck that's rising through the convection zone will tend to tilt it so that when the, when the loop pokes out, it will be tilted in such a way that the leading spot in the direction of rotation, or in the, in the eastward direction here, is displaced toward the equator relative to the trailing spot. And then the dispersal of this, so subsequent after emergence, turbulent convection will tend to disperse this and also meridional flow. And if, these, if the leading edges reconnect across the equator and the trailing edges get, get dispersed toward the poles, then this can generate a mean poloidal field. And this is known as the Bab babcock leighton mechanism. Uh, so, so the the flux emergent process can generate poloidal field. It can also release magnetic helicity, which uh, gets to this uh, problem with the convection di convective dynamos. Will they work at high magnetic Reynolds number? Basically, the, the reason why people say maybe not is because of the accumulation of, of helicity. Magnetic helicity on small scales could kill the dynamo. Well, if you, if you send it out through the, through the uh, boundary, then, then that's not, not uh, an issue anymore. Although Babcock main dynamo models do have uh, helicity constraints. But the idea is that you can build um, dynamo models based on this babcock leighton mechanism. So this is uh, one of the leading models by, uh, here at HAO by Masumi Dikpati and Peter Gilman. And the idea is you start out with a poloidal field, differential rotation, fast equator slow pulse, stretches this out into a toroidal field that's asymmetric about the equator. 
And then the Babcock-Layton mechanism kicks in. You have rising flux tubes. They become buoyantly unstable. They rise. They poke through the surface. And the sense of this tilt is such that the trailing spots have an opposite polarity relative to the pre-existing poloidal field. So if you move this flux to the poles, it can, it can reverse the sign of this poloidal cap. And then the poloidal field of opposing sign that you induce in the surface later layers gets, and, and we think there's a, they, they, these models postulate that there's a poleward flow in the surface layers and a return equatorward flow deeper in the convection zone. The poleward flow we actually do observe on the sun. So when this process generates poloidal field near the surface, that poloidal field is advected toward the poles by a combination of meridional circulation and turbulent diffusion. And then it goes up toward the poles, and then it gets pulled down to the bottom of the convection zone, provides the seed for the next cycle. So these, this is a babcock layton dynamo. They're also called flux transport dynamo models. babcock layton really refers to the source of the poloidal field. Flux transport refers to the transport of the poloidal field, which is here due to the meridional circulation. Um, but in, in, in practice, you can have babcock layton dynamo models that have uh, transport by, uh, by turbulence as well, convective transport. So that, those are flux transport dynamo models, not to be confused with surface flux transport models. Th these are different things. These are not dynamo models. These, and they're two-dimensional in a different sense. The other, these babcock layton dynamo models are two-dimensional in radius and latitude. These guys are two-dimensional in latitude and longitude. And what they do is they're powered by data assimilation. So this oval that's going by, um, this is unwrapping 360 degrees on the surface of the sun. So this is longitude, this is latitude. Uh, black and white indicate uh, inward and outward field, like on the first um, slide I showed, field pointing radially inward and outward on the sun. And this oval is the side of the sun that's facing us. So this is this way you have actual measurements of what the field is. And what you can do is you can put that into your model and then follow the evolution based on the observed meridional flow. By meridional, I mean uh, generally poleward, and differential rotation, which is faster at the equator and slower at the poles. And you can put in some model for turbulent diffusion and then let these, these flux elements evolve. And they do pretty much what um, the magnetograms I showed from Hathaway. They do uh, show that the trailing edges do tend to migrate toward the poles and flip the, the polar caps. So they suggest that the flux emerging in sunspots may be responsible for flipping the dipole moment, at least at the surface. Again, we don't know what's going on deeper down. Does it really work out? Well, about observationally, you can determine that about 10 to the 25th uh, to 10 to the 26 Maxwells of flux emerge in sunspots in active regions over the course of an 11-year solar cycle. If you have a 10-gauss polar field distributed over 20 degrees in latitude, latitude northward is 70 degrees, say, that's about 10 to the 22 Maxwells. So even if most of this stuff gets annihilated at low latitudes, even if only 1% of it, gets to the poles, that's enough to flip the, the, pole, the dipole moment of the sun. So there's more than enough flux emerging in sunspots to account for the, for the flip. And the nice thing about babcock layton models, if that is the main source of poloidal field in the sun, then we can see it. Then we can, we can see the, the in, inner, inner workings of the dynamo, because it happens at the surface. So you can say that the source term for poloidal field at a given cycle should be proportional to the amount of flux that's there, which is like the sunspot number, times the mean tilt of the active regions. And you can say that if that, like in this picture, if that provides, if that provides the seed for the next cycle, then the, the next cycle, the strength of the next cycle should be correlated with this babcock layton source term of the previous cycle. And that's what this plot is. It does. <coughs> Oops, I'm going back. That's what this plot is. They, we, we don't have that much good data on tilt angles. This, this goes back to about a century, solar cycle 15 or so. 
Um, we, we have sunspot observations, like I said, for 400 years, but really detailed observations of what the tilts are and things we, we only have for the last um, 10 cycles or so, nine or 10 cycles. But it does seem to loosely correlate. So, so that is observational evidence that, that Babcock, this babcock leighton mechanism may be doing something. So babcock leighton models operate, require the presence of sunspots to operate. But the dirty little secret of them is that they don't really have sunspots. What they do is they solve this magnetic induction equation, dBdt. So this is the induction equation from magnetohydrodynamics. This is straight up MHD, no approximations. And then what you do is you average it over longitude, indicated by the bars here. And you get terms that depend on, this is the omega effect, the creation of toroidal field by gradients in the rotation rate. And then this is the advection of, of magnetic fields, mean magnetic fields, by the meridional flow, which is an important component as well. This is the molecular diffusion here, which is ignored. And this term is the curl of what's called the turbulent EMF. I've talked about this as the holy grail of dynamo theory, because without it, you can show that the dynamo will die. This is Cowling's theorem, that you cannot have an axisymmetric dynamo. You need, the primes here indicate non-axisymmetric motions. So you need some kind of non-axisymmetric non flow across non-axisymmetric field to give you a, a net EMF to power the dynamo. And what in babcock leighton models, what they do is they say that EMF is due to a turbulent diffusion and the source term, which has an amplitude, it has a radial profile that peaks near the top, it has a latitudinal profile that you dial in, it has some kind of quenching, quenching so the dynamo just doesn't run away because this equation is linear. So if, it's, if you have a growing solution, it will grow exponentially until you stop it. So you put in some quenching. And then it depends on the magnetic field at the bottom of the convection zone. So some measure of the magnetic field, so the source, the polar field at the top, it depends in some way on the magnetic field at the bottom. So this is, so this is how babcock leighton models, di dynamo models operate with this axisymmetric source term. And then uh, this, what, the connection to sunspots comes, you compare sunspot observations with the toroidal field at the bottom of the convection zone. So there's a, there's a, big, there's a big gap here that from the, to go from the bottom of the convection zone to the surface. So, so babcock leighton dynamo models don't really have sunspots until now. This is the first dynamo, I think it's fair to say that this is the first dynamo model ever constructed that actually has sunspots. And I can stop this. If you look closely at this movie, you can see that they, at, at one time, it's hard to stop this at the right spot, but it, they, they obey uh, Hale's law, which is that you have sunspots pa sunspot pairs, and the leading side is anti-symmetric about the equator. So it's red up here, it's blue down here. Uh, and, they, and the trailing spot is at the opposite sign. And they obey uh, Joy's law, which says that there's a tilt. There's a tilt in these active regions that depends on latitude. Here at the equator, and it increases higher latitudes. And if you look closely at this thing, it, toward the end, it reverses, so they have the opposite. Some sunspots, there should be. There are some sunspots there. Toward the end, they have a blue leading spot and a red trailing spot. And, and if, I, if I play this again, so this is, this is in a rotating frame, a frame rotating with the, with the sun. So a stationary spot would be rotating at the mean solar rotation rate. As this thing plays, you'll see spots closer to the equator, and they zip across the, the face. That's due to the differential rotation. But this is something we call bash we, for babcock latent ash, because it's built on the ash framework, um, but it's a babcock latent. We could have called it blash, but bash seems somehow more forceful and more festive. So, <laughs> and, and note the, uh, the, the strong font there. So, um, so yeah, this is something we just got working in the last month. Um, 
it's his years. So it goes, it goes for about 20 years. Uh, well, I'll show you that. So this is, uh, so um, yeah, I'll hold on, hold on with that. But, uh, so, so this is more faithful to the original vision of Babcock and Leighton. If you look at their original papers, they talk about things in terms of these, these two-dimensional latitude-longitude surface of what happens when a tilted spot, spot pair is, disperses on the surface. It wasn't until Leighton's later papers, 1969, say, uh, a year after I was born, that um, they really started formulating this in terms of an axisymmetric source term, which all current babcock leighton models use. So it looks from here that the spots appear and go away. But just like in the sun, they don't. They don't go away. That flux remains. And so this is the radial flux averaged over um, longitude. So this is similar to the, to the magnetic butterfly diagrams I was showing. So this is the radial flux at the surface versus latitude and time. This is in years. Um, so uh, you, you see the sunspots are formed at mid-latitudes, and the trailing flux does go up, and it's advected up to the poles by the meridional circulation and turbulent diffusion, and it goes to reverse the sign of the polar of the polar field. And it reverses about every 11 years. And note that this, so, so this is what you actually would compare with observations, not this, which is what the, the proxy at the bottom of the convection zone. So this is the mean toroidal field at the bottom of the convection zone. Uh, so this go, undergoes a butterfly type um, reversals and, and equatorward migration, as in uh, other babcock leighton models. This doesn't look exactly like the sun. There are certain things, uh, for example, this doesn't have a, f a smooth propagation toward the equator. You see a lot of spots at mid-latitudes, and then it rushes toward the equator in, in a time scale of a few years. And if you look closely, this thing is drifting. The northern hemisphere is drifting a little bit relative to the southern hemisphere. This is actually a well-known problem with badcock latent dynamo models in that the quadrupole mode has a similar growth rate to the dipole mode. So this thing is drifting toward uh, a quadrupolar phase that has, it started with a dipole by initial conditions, but it's drifting toward more a quadrupole phase with a symmetric magnetic field, toroidal magnetic field about the equator. And both of these things are details of how we set up the model that as we develop more sophisticated models, the, both of these, I mean, they have been dealt with in, in uh, babcock leighton models, actually symmetric babcock leighton models previously. But um, <clears throat> so this, I think, addresses Jeff's question. There, there, are, there are minima here. Oh, well, in the next, the next um, slide will also address that. But this is the mean fields as a function of time over a, a couple of reversals. So this is the mean toroidal field. It's strongest near the bottom of the convection zone. And this is the mean poloidal field. <clears throat> this is the surface of the sun here. It includes a potential field extrapolation. So uh, blue and red are, are field lines. Uh, red, is, red is counterclockwise, I believe. Blue is clockwise of the orientation of the poloidal field. But the idea is this spurting in and out are, are the appearance of spots, that, that you, you get spots and, uh, at, at low latitudes and mid-latitudes, and then that flux is uh, eventually transported to the poles, and it, and it acts to, to flip, the, uh, flip the sign of the polar field. And so this is the scalar um, time plot. So this is uh, versus time. This is the blue is the mean toroidal energy in the mean toroidal magnetic field. Uh, red is the mean poloidal field. Green is the non-axisymmetric field, which is absent in all other babcock leighton dynamos. Uh, and what you see here is you start off with the dipole field in the red, and, and the differential rotation stretches it out, creating toroidal field. When the field gets strong enough, it starts to make sunspots. Now, at, and sunspots, as I'll talk about, have a component in the mean poloidal field, and they have a component in the non-axisymmetric field. And about 26, uh, after about 26 years, it, it was necessary, in order to get this thing going, it was necessary to have a relatively low threshold to, to make spots. Otherwise, the dynamo would kind of die away before its spots are made. 
So, so you get it going with the relatively strong spots and numerous spots, and then you can, you can dial these things down and then let it churn away. And, and, and it does go through cycles, 11-year cycles. You can see it in the number of, of sunspots here in the non-axisymmetric magnetic energy and in the, in the energy in the mean poloidal field. And they're even a little bit asymmetric. That it, the rise time is a little faster than the decay time, which is, uh, which is what you see in the sun. So how did we set this thing up? Basically, this is the equation we solved. That's all there is to it. Uh, this dB dt is curl V cross B minus a turbulent diffusion times the curl of B. So this is the same equation that, that Masumi solves. Um, and we use the same with, with two differences, which I'll get to. Uh, so we use the same mean flows. For velocity, we put in a solar differential rotation, and a differential rotation that's inspired by solar observations. Fast equator, slow pull conical contours at mid-latitudes. For a meridional circulation, this is the contours of the mass flux. So we have a, a, a flow that goes toward the poles near the surface, back toward the equator uh, at the bottom of the convection zone, and it goes this way in the south, this way in the north. And again, the polar field is observed um, from uh, uh, Doppler measurements of the surface, uh, tracer measurements of the surface, and local helioseismic inversions. So we know that the meridional flow is indeed going poleward at the surface. We don't really know what it is below, but I'll, I'll get to that. Um, and then for a turbulent diffusion, we use the same thing that Masumi uses for her flux transport dynamo models. We use a, a, <coughs> a profile that's about 10 to the 12th in CGS units near the top decreases to a lower level in the convection zone, and then below the convection zone, it, it drops. Where, where there's no turbulence, essentially, it drops to a very low value. And the velocity um, at r equals 1 near the surface is about 10 meters per second, 11 meters per second, and it's a few meters per second at the bottom of the convection zone. So I said this is the same equation Masumi saw, but with two differences. One, it's three-dimensional. And two, it does not have a Babcock latent source term. It does not have any parameterization for a turbulent EMF. Instead, it has spots, and the spots not only are there, it's not only the first dynamo that has spots, but the spots are essential for the operation of the dynamo. It would die without them. Um, so <coughs> we have this routine called Spot Maker that introduces spots sporadically and systematically based on the dynamo generated field. And then you let them evolve naturally under the influence of mean flows and eta t. So you just solve this, this induction equation. You don't put in any, any parameterization for the EMF. You let it, you let it develop naturally. Um, so this holy grail, you don't have to make any guesses for what that holy grail is doing. It's, it's, it's occurring on, on its own. So, the, so when you put in spots, you have to decide where to put them and when to put them. So to do that, we define a spot-producing toroidal field so we take uh, B hat here. So we take the, the, the three-dimensional um, longitudinal field in the simulation, and we average it over some region near the base of the convection zone to get this B hat as a function of latitude, longitude, and time. And note that it's still a function of longitude, so it's not necessarily anti-axisymmetric. And then we slap a, a function on it, a G of theta. This is similar to what Mas Masumi uses in her um, Babcock latent source term. And basically what it does is it suppresses spots at high latitudes. Mainly, that's a semi-empirical thing. We don't see spots at high latitudes. And there, you can debate the reasons for that. Uh, one re potential re region, reason is that um, the differential rotation at high latitudes should be unstable to the magnetorotational instability. So it's possible that instabilities prevent fields from building up at high latitudes and, and creating sunspots. So anyway, we, we confine them to low latitudes, and then so we slap a, a, a masking function onto this field. And then whenever that field is greater than some threshold value, make a spot at that latitude, longitude, and time. I'll, I'll get to that. So this is, this is just, just deciding where and when to put the spot. Um, but if this is all you did, then at one time step, you would make a spot. The next time step, you would make a spot in almost the identical place. 
because this, this so what, what you do <coughs> is you also put in some kind of lag. So you can say, uh, introduce a, a, this introduces a delay time, it also introduces randomness. So you can say that the, this, the probability that you're gonna get a spot is governed by a log normal distribution, say, just as something, something to use. And then say the, the probability at one time lag uh, delta in years, if you wait one year or two years or three years, the probability that a spot should have happened by now is the cumulative di distribution function, the integral of this, which is just an error function. So, so that's, that, that's the blue curve. So it goes from zero up to, if you wait long enough, the probability is one that, that you should get a spot. So, so this, this is a very simple, and, and we could put in more sophisticated things, but this is something simple just to get it going. And so, so this, this, this determines where and when to put it. And then once you decide where and when to put it, you have to decide what its, what its structure is gonna be. So the surface field is some, uh, is S, which is the sign of B hat at the bottom, which gives you the right um, sign for, for uh, Hale's law. And times some amplitude, times some profile for the trailing spot minus the leading spot. So the, the trailing spot has the same sign as the toroidal field at the bottom, the leading spot has the opposite sign. And then you put in a tilt um, from observations. These are MDI observations by Stenfo and Kosovichev. The, the tilt angle is, um, they, often people do this linearly, but they use a cosine fit. So this is uh, fitted to actual data of the, uh, the tilt angle is zero at the equator. It increases toward higher latitudes and then levels off a bit at mid latitudes. So a cosine fits it pretty well. So you put in that, you choose the tilt angle based on that. Uh, the cross sections of these things, you can use Gaussians or polynomials. Polynomials have the advantage that they're localized so that you, you, you don't have to, in, in your loop in Fortran, you don't have to loop over all latitudes and longitudes. You can just do it in the vicinity of, of your spot. And then for the field strength, you can set, you, you can basically, to get the field strength, we can say that the, we specify the flux in a spot is proportional to this, this B quantity here is the strength of the toroidal field near the bottom of the convection zone divided by some quenching field strength. So it, it's set up so that with B equals one, so for very small, for B much less than one, the flux in the spot is proportional uh, to the field strength at the bottom of the convection zone. But if you make it much stronger, then it's gonna saturate at some value. It, it's gonna saturate at a quenching field strength and the field, the flux at that quenching field strength will be about 10 to the 23rd Maxwells, which are the biggest spots we see. Um, so this is a side view, this is the mean field. So when you put in this spot, because of the tilt angle it, and you average over longitude, it does have a non-zero axisymmetric component. And then for the subsurface structure, you take this and you do a potential field extrapolation below the surface and say that it should vanish the field should va vanish below some radius um, that you can specify. We use 0.95 here. So the rationale, there's no good rationale for this. The field is not potential below the surface of the sun, but no matter what I put in here, you can make the same argument that there's no good justification for it because we just don't know what the subsurface structure of sunspots is. But this is a good initial approximation for two reasons. First of all, we do see from observations that sunspots do seem to, although they, they originate from the bottom of the convection zone, their rise time is of order a month, and they seem to decouple from their roots in a matter of days. Uh, they, they only live for, for a few weeks. So all of these time scales are very short compared to the 11 year solar activity cycle. So we can say that these things tend to decouple and they're mostly confined near the surface uh, instantaneously, uh, effectively. And so this is, this potential field extrapolation just gives you something that's confined to the surface. And then you just let it go. And so this is part, I mentioned the space climate initiative idea. So th this is part, we've already done the first step, which was to unify for the first time flux transport dynamo models and surface flux transport models. So we've already unified these two pictures into a self-consistent dynamo. Um, what we plan to do when we add in a momentum equation 
we expect to see, these are a simulation of, of tachocline instabilities. Basically, if you have a toroidal field, this is B phi, uh, blue is eastward, red is westward in two different hemispheres. Basically, if you have a ring of toroidal field in the presence of a latitudinal differential rotation, it's unstable to a tipping instability. It's gonna wanna tip. It's like a pencil standing on its end. And so if we incorporate the momentum equation, we, we expect to, to see these things um, naturally developing, and these in turn will give you non-axis symmetry non in the emerging flux, which there is some evidence for. And then what's nice about BASH is the SH stands for spherical harmonic. So it is very simple, as a first approximation at least, to do a potential field source surface extrapolation of that field into the heliosphere and corona. And uh, so that's the first step in, ex in, in, in extending this model to the corona and heliosphere. Um, more down the road, we want to do more sophisticated extrapolations, um, as in this paper by uh, Pinto et al. But the idea is to extrapolate this field into the corona and heliosphere and see how the heliosphere and corona respond to the time varying field um, produced by the dynamo. So these are the promising future Lorentz force feedbacks. We can also, for the first time, since this is the first model that actually has sunspots, we can put in, we, we know by looking at the sun that sunspots are places where the irradiance increases. That, well, the, the, the sunspot itself, the, the irradiance is lower, but the plages around them have a, have a larger irradiance. So the net, the net effect is the, the, a cooling in active bands and a converging flow into these active regions. And we can include that. And, 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 and I, mentioned, um, I mentioned the idea that, that if the badcock latent mechanism is really powering the dynamo, then we should see the saturation mechanism in data and the saturation mechanism of which, which prevents the dynamo from, from increasing exponentially and sets the amplitude and strength of solar cycles might be this meridional flow, converging flow into these active regions which suppresses the, dis the dispersal of them due that, that powers the Babcock latent mechanism. So we can, we can look into that for the first time in a real uh, dynamo model. We, as I said, we can couple to the corona and hemisphere uh, and because these are like the surface flux transport models, we can do data assimilation in these things um, better than any previous dynamo model has done. We don't need to average magnetograms from the sun over longitude. We can use photospheric magnetograms from data and, and power the dynamo with that and, um, and, and generate predictions for, for, uh, for for forecasting the, the strength of the next cycle based on that. And then finally, convection didn't play much of a role in any of this. <coughs> it's only in there as a turbulent diffusion. But we know that is a gross um, simplification. There is a, this is a convection zone. There is, there is convection there. So we can include the turbulent transport of magnetic flux and field amplification from, from a, a convective dynamo we can exclude that explicitly by including convection, or we can include, include it implicitly, putting in an effective alpha tensor uh, obtained from convective dynamo simulations. Let me just check my time. Um, so a closer look at this is the equation we solve. Um, so what is the input? There, so, so it's a promising endeavor, this, this, this BASH model, but in order for us to actually operate the model, we have to put in what the mean flows are, we have to put in what the turbulent diffusion is, and we have to put in this thing called spot maker, we have to put in the spots. There's no physics in spot maker. We just, we just have a toroidal field at the bottom and we put a spot in the top. Mean flows, we have a good idea what the differential rotation is doing. The marinal circulation, we don't know what it's doing below the surface. And turbulent transport, we don't know how the main question is how efficient is that eta compared to the meridional flow transport? And that, again, we don't know. So in order to support this model, we're, we're, we're doing um, a lot of uh, supplementary modeling efforts to understand these three basic things. And, uh, and those are based on both heliosismology and modeling. Uh, so as I said, we know pretty well what the omega profile in the sun is. This is from heliosismology, fast equator, slow pole. This is the rotation rate in nanohertz. Um, so this, the equator is spinning faster than the pole. Um, conical contours in mid-latitudes. We already have this in there. 
But the only information we have about the meridional flow is that it's, it's poleward about 10 to 20 meters per second at the surface, which we have in there, but we don't know what it's doing below the surface. But enter theory and modeling. If you look at what determines the meridional circulation in the sun, after a while, you're led to, after careful consideration, you're not led to the meridional component of the momentum equation. You're led to the zonal or the longitudinal component of the momentum equation. So this is the longitudinal component of the MHD momentum equation. No assumptions. This is straight up MHD. So d by dt of rho times L, where L is the specific angular momentum. Lambda here is the cylindrical radius, the distance from the rotation axis. So d by dt of the specific angular momentum times the density is equal to uh, a term that involves the advection of angular momentum by the meridional circulation. And this net torque term, this net torque term includes a contribution from a Reynolds stress, a Lorentz force, and a viscous diffusion. These, the, this is negligible in the sun. A Lorentz force, if that, that a Lorentz force tends to suppress shear. Magnetism tends to suppress shear rather than generate shear. So the main player here is, is likely the Reynolds stress. So the, the basic idea is that the Reynolds stress, the angular momentum transport by the Reynolds stress is what determines the meridional flow because in a steady state, this guy has to balance this guy. So the meridional flow, the advection of angular momentum by the meridional flow is balanced by the convective angular momentum transport by the Reynolds stress. And this thing we know. Grad L, we know from solar observations, because from hemoseismic conversions, we know what omega is. So grad L, we find, increases, is approximately cylindrical contours. It increases away from the rotation axis. So what this tells us is anywhere there is, where there is a convergence of angular momentum, if this is positive, then we should drive a meridional flow along the same direction as grad L. We should drive a meridional flow away from the rotation axis where it's negative. We should drive a meridional flow toward the rotation axis. And that's exactly what we see in convection simulations. We find in convection simulations that there are two regimes, a fast rotation and a slow rotation regime. I'm going to go through this kind of quick because I'm, I don't have much time. But the idea is in a fast rotation, you have uh, omega profiles, fast equator, slow pole. If you're rotating slow enough, the convection tends to conserve its angular momentum, and you get fast pull, slow equator, the omega profile flips. These tend to have single-celled meridional circulation profiles. These tend to have multiple cell uh, circulation profiles. But you can understand that in terms of the physics of convection at high latitudes. So, so what these show now are the convergence of the Reynolds stress. Blue is positive. Blue is, is convergence. Red is divergence. So basically, at high latitudes, you have ballistic plumes, downward plumes coming in. As they come in, they're deflected by the Coriolis force toward the right in the northern hemisphere, so they transport angular momentum inward. At low latitudes, you have columnar um, banana cells, the columnar convective cells that are aligned with the rotation axis. And they're tilted in such a way that they transport angular momentum cylindrically outward, so away from the rotation axis. So there's a convergence here and a divergence at the bottom of the convection zone. So with this idea of gyroscopic pumping, this says wherever you see blue here, there should be a flow away from the rotation axis. Wherever you see red, there should be a flow toward the rotation axis. And that's exactly, so, so multiple cells down here, single cell up there due to mass conservation, and that's exactly what we see. So where is the sun? Fast rotators, uh, this, is the, this is the meridional mo momentum equation. Uh, taking the curl, the meridional momentum equation gives you something um, that's called thermal wind balance. D by dz of the omega profile is proportional to the entropy gradient. This thing you might expect to scale with omega. This thing scales with omega squared. So as you, as you spin up the star, you expect the rotation profile to become more cylindrical. Which, by which I mean uh, angular velocity omega contour is aligned with the rotation axis. So fast rotators, we would expect cylindrical omega profile, multi-celled circulation, slow rotators, anti-solar omega profile, single-celled circulation. The sun is very close to the transition. And so we, we don't know exactly what it's doing. It might be doing something unusual like this thing. 
This thing is near the, near the transition. It has a fast equator slow pole, but it has a single cell in rotation profile. <coughs> and we, we think, so just, just briefly I'll talk about, um, it, this gets to the, to the issue of turbulent transport. What, what is the efficiency of turbulent transport? And you say, well, can't you just take, you have the ASH code, can't you just take that BASH dynamo model, that Babcock Leighton dynamo model, and put convection in, and then you have a real solar dynamo model with convection and everything, is, everything works. Well, no, because we tried that with an axisymmetric Babcock Leighton source term. And you do get nice cycles, but the problem is that the convective transport is of order a month. So after you, after you um, create poloidal field near the top of the convection zone, convection pushes it down to the bottom in something like a month, and these cycles are six months long instead of 11 years. So in order, to, in order to not screw up your dynamo, you have to understand what the transport efficiency is, and in particular, are we overestimating it in these, in these simulations? And the answer is probably somewhat, but not by many orders of magnitude. Um, be, and again, I won't go into this in detail, but basically, um, all the other codes out there, the, the Charbonneau et al. group, the pencil code group from, from Nordita, uh, Yuhang also, um, and we're getting into this game too, but basically everybody, if you use solar parameters, you have to somehow limit your convective velocity because if it gets too big, then you'll flip and you'll get a fast pull and a slow equator. So we have to understand what limits the convective velocity. And so, so fr from, a, from a, a modeling standpoint, it looks like we're overestimating the convective velocities. Um, but you can go back to the observations and this gyroscopic pumping equation, you know meridional flow near the surface, you know what this L profile is. So if convection is maintaining it, then you can get just from helioseismic inversions, you can get an estimate of what the convective velocity is. And, um, and to sustain a meridional flow of, or, of order two meters per second, you need a convective velocity of at least 45 meters per second. And this suggests a turbulent diffusion that's more than 10 to the 12th. And so this, this comes from um, data. There's, there's a theoretical interpolation, interpretation of data but it's independent of convection models. This is an independent estimate of what the, what the uh, efficiency of turbulent transport should be. And I'm, I won't, it, it's consistent with convective models. I, I won't go into this into, into detail because I'm running out of time, but just, um, I'll just mention the final point here is where do sunspots come from? Beautiful work by Maria Weber that I don't have time to talk about, <laughs> but, but she has basically put, um, uh, thin flux tubes inside an ash convection simulation and looked at how, um, how the, the uh, combination of convection and uh, magnetic buoyancy can, can work together to, to, get, to get flux out and, um, and assessing things like Joy's Law, the tilt angle. I just wanted to point out that in order to answer the question of where do sunspots come from, we've basically made the first steps in HIO's Frontier 4, which is unifying conductive dynamo simulations with simulations of flux emergence. So I, I talked about, toward the beginning of the talk, coming for full circle, I talked about these reefs, the, these um, t uh, coherent toroidal fields which exist in the midst of a turbulent convection zone. Uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, people said this wasn't possible, that these should be unstable to the magnetic buoyancy instability. You can't have, or disrupted by convected turbulence, you can't have coherent toroidal field flux systems within a turbulent convection zone. But we do find them, and what's more, if you get the diffusion low enough, they do become unstable and they rise. So this is the first self-consistent simulation of the generation of a buoyant flux tube. And by self-consistent, I mean convection creates, convection under the influence of rotation and stratification generates a differential rotation, which generates a toroidal field, which becomes buoyantly unstable and rises. And Nick Nelson, this is Nick Nelson's thesis work, and I don't, I, partly why I didn't talk about this is he just gave the colloquium two weeks ago and talked about it in a lot of detail. But he's identified over 130 of these things in, in one simulation. 
uh, and, and they come up just like in Maria's simplified thin flux tube models. They come up through a, a, a teamwork between the magnetic buoyancy and the advection by giant cells. But I'll just summarize there. <coughs> uh, everybody's invited to the bash. This is a, 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 a group effort. And this is, this is something, as I said, it's part of the Space Climate Initiative. that we want to uh, address things like, like not only the, the dynamo, but it's coupling to the corona and heliosphere and irradiance. Um, and uh, so it's a, it's a big effort. And let me know if you want to get involved. So this is the first ever solar dynamo model with sunspots. It's a 3D babcock Layton model. It's a unification of babcock Layton dynamo models with 2D surface flux transport models. And in order to support this effort, we're going both ways. And we're, we're going above the sun with the Space Climate Initiative. But we're also going below the surface and trying to clarify with complementary modeling, helioseismic, and, and theoretical efforts. Uh, to really get at the underlying physics that goes into this model, including what the circulation is, what the turbulent transport is, and, and where do sunspots come from. And I'll stop there. I think that's right. Tell us how much of an effort is involved with BASH for your party. How many guests are coming and how many person years would be involved to be successful with it? Well, that, that is yet to be determined. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that we we're just coming up with and formulating in the last few weeks. It, we're not quite sure exactly where we want to propose, and but uh, I, I, at least we do have at least one confirmed par partner. So some of the folks at, at LASP are, are involved in, in the irradiance side of this, uh, and so we're we're still formulating it. That, that it's not, but but it, it it will be a significant effort when we get our act together. <laughs> Mark, um, so in your kinematic models, you had to. In yes. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, does that mean that kinematic models can't on their own generate spots? That's you right. need dy you need dynamics. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, in order for the magnetic buoyancy instability to operate, you you need feedback between the the, the magnetic fields, the the flow field, and the and the thermal um, the thermal properties of the flow. So yes, you you can't you can't have a magnetic buoyancy instability with a kinematic model. And you can't have it also with the axisymmetric model. <laughs> but I guess more generally, you can't get that tight collection of field lines with the purely kinematic. That, that's right. That, that's the, that's the, so there, just to repeat the question, that you can't get that tight collection of field lines with a purely kinematic model. The, the main issue there is what is your effective diffusion in your simulation? And global convection simulations can't can't generate, the, the game is to generate a, a concentrated enough flux tube with your numerical diffusion or, or your explicit diffusion that will become strong enough to rise. And that, that's, that's a challenge that, that's at the forefront of, of modeling the solar interior. And that's why, that's why Maria's models have been so useful, is, is you can, a thin flux tube approximation is effectively an infinite magnetic Reynolds number. There's no, there's no diffusion. So you, can, so you can look at that coupled with the convective dynamo simulations tells you a lot about how flux tubes should behave in a convection zone. And so as time goes on, we will use those flux tube rising simulations to develop a better spot maker, to, to have, have a distribution of spot strengths and tilt angles that's more like what we see in the sun. Yeah. At the start of the talk, you had mentioned the magnetic Reynolds number is on the order of 10 to the th third in simulations, whereas the astrophysical flows are 10 to the seventh. Yep. As you go from one order of magnitude to another in the Reynolds number, what scaling do you see or need in the computational machinery in order to capture that physics? And do you envision down the road that 
uh, aspects of spot maker will be replaced by more realistic first principle calculations? Yeah, eventually we would very much like to see a spot maker replaced by a more self-consistent simulation. Um, and the question of how, how will things scale as you increase the magnetic Reynolds number, nobody really knows. That, that is to, to take something from uh, Anique Pouquet about, she said this about hydrodynamic turbulence. She said every time we increase the resolution by an order of, uh, by a factor of two, we learn something new. Uh, and es that's especially the case with MHD turbulence. You have this, this extra, the, the magnetic field tends to be highly intermittent. And observations of solar magnetic fields suggest that they're fibril in, in nature. So, so what will happen at a magnetic Reynolds number of 10 to the seventh is really anybody's guess. That, that there's probably no such thing as an isolated flux tube. Um, but in the sun, the, there are surely patches of concentrated field that are more intense than anything we're seeing. So. Um, Will we achieve that in the next? Yeah, it depends on how long Moore's law uh, <laughs> keep, keeps up. <laughs> no, but it, 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 it's it's a formidable challenge, and which is why we need these complementary simulations. And in addition to going forward with Bash, we will go forward with with these uh, Frontier Four and HIO, which is to to do convective dynamos with tachoclines and to see how flux tubes form. And those will only get better as the computers get more powerful. Does that answer the question? Yeah, as you mentioned, the Nelson's work is the first step towards directly self-consistently formed tubes. From yeah. Um, yeah, I have a quick question. That mm -hmm. um, in your current formulation of the uh, spot maker and kinematic dynamo, um, the uh, there's no feedback in the toroidal field. That's right. In the as a result of forming a sunspot, you don't have any reduction of the toroidal field. So s to saturate a dynamo, mm -hmm. you don't have that nonlinear. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, so, but, but that's, another, that's another thing that we could make the models more sophisticated. Uh, and Piali was saying that, that in, in, their, in their babcock layton models, that, that th what, what saturates the, the dynamo is that they actually, every, every time they, they have a poloidal field or they, or they generate, this, this is the ring, is this the ring algorithm? No, it's, but, but when when you put flocks on the on on the surface, you take it away from the toroidal field at the bottom. So so that that's that is something that we could do in the future. That that's been done with axisymmetric models. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank Mark. Thank you for coming.